often wonder if like clapping is a, considered a percussion instrument. I actually don't often wonder that. Because that would mean I'm insane. Anyway, welcome to the show. My name is Dean. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, really nice day today. Really nice day. Um, you know, something there's feeling, you know, when you listen to certain songs, certain music, and you're like, oh, that reminds me of a better time. Uh, or where you you eat a certain meal that your mom made, and uh, you're, or maybe you, you had as a kid, and you're like, oh, that's that's comfort food. Please welcome to the program my content comfort food. Your friend and mine, protest mania lady, maybe the bravest human being I've ever met, lawyer, advocate, owner of sadvocacy.com, still have a hard time saying it, landlord, tenant, lawyer, Basically, the toughest person I've ever met. Please welcome back to the program, Ms. Kareem Assad, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. I see you in a blazer. Looking Thank good. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you coming from? Funeral? What were you doing? <laughs> I had a hearing today, um, and I thought I would continue to look good for you. So. Thank you. Good. I appreciate it. How often do you wear blazers? I've never seen you one. Usually, you're in like a Stone Cold 316 shirt or some kind of wrestling paraphernalia when you're doing anything. That's uh, my preferred and, attire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's either that or blazer. There is not very much in between. Hey, question. Do you get in trouble if you show up to court dressed in like an ACDC shirt and jeans? If you're a lawyer? Will you if get it? Yeah, if you're a lawyer, you can't do that. If you're, you know, the accused or a litigant in yeah. theory. Um, but I had to once make a client turn their shirt inside out because it was a a French connection shirt. Um, oh, FC UK. Yeah. One. And then I was like, what are you wearing? Yeah. You know, so clothes matter. I, I encourage everyone to not wear uh, ACDC in court, but I definitely can't. I don't like, like are you not allowed? What's with the things? You're a lawyer. Like, you go to court. What's with the, the ascot? Do you have to wear one of those when you go to court? And do you always like, yeah, cause I see in Canada, the lawyers, they carry around these like air, air, airline briefcases all the time. They're wheeling them around with all their files and shit. Do you do that too? Because you, you're not really. Like, I know you're a lawyer, very good lawyer and very good standing, but you don't really fit the lawyer mold, right? Of like the person that takes himself seriously, slicked back hair. Like you go out on your e-scooter on a fur coat uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a, you know, a, a save Karima mega red hat on half the time. I mean, you know, you're also a personality, right? So like, do you get in trouble sometimes? Like, do you, will you go to court and go, ooh, I should, probably shouldn't wear this, even though I know I'm going to court? Or do you always check your fit before you do? Um, so there's different levels of court. So yeah. the outfit that you're referring to is for very specific types of proceedings, which um, when I have them, yeah. I prepare well in advance to know that that's what I need to wear. So it has like different components to the outfit and I try to keep them all in the same place. Um, with varying degrees of success. Um, I've never like shown up to court and been like, oh no, I'm dressed inappropriately. Uh, it helps a great deal that it's online for the most part now um, because I just need to worry about this part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can wear shorts, um, right? Yeah, All right. I'm in jeans right now. It's great. Um, no, but I, I don't, uh, you know, I wear clothes because we have to. Um, and because it's cold in this climate, but like it's, it's frowned upon generally to go out without them, right? You can get a lot of yeah, trouble. So, as a lawyer. You know, I'm just it's what you do. I do the the minimum of what's required. Bare minimum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's gonna be clipped. Um, that's fine. <laughs> Legally, when it comes to my attire, I do the bare minimum. Uh, it's probably why we're friends. I do the exact same thing. I've been wearing black t-shirts and jeans for the past 20 years. And if someone said, Hey, listen, you got to put a suit on for today. I go, I just won't be showing up. It's genius. If like Steve, Steve, what's his name? Steve jobs or yeah. Mark. S Steve jobs, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Yes, those guys, jeans. Right. You know, so yeah. they're like, Oh, it's so smart. They wear the same clothes every day. Yeah. So. Yeah, dude. I, that's that. It's so much easier on my brain. That's why yeah. I have black t-shirts and jeans, right? Because it's like I don't. I know I don't have to pick anything. I don't have to worry about it. I've started to mix it up wearing different color shirts, but I don't have a professional obligation like you do of dressing up going to court. But let's can we talk real quick about Zoom court? Has that not just changed the game for you? Like, how much happier are you as a lawyer that you can go to like virtual court? You don't have to go to real and stand there with all the stuffies. Uh, it has pros and cons. Um, you know, it's very convenient, obviously, uh, but it also can be 
a bit isolating in the sense that I'm a sole practitioner. So I would interact with other lawyers or paralegals in courtroom settings. Um, so yeah. that just doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, and for the clients, it depends. Again, there's that convenience factor. Um, but sometimes like the gravity sinks in better if they're physically in court um, or, you know, not everyone has the technology. Um, so like that requires special accommodation sometimes, whereas they could just show up physically. Um, so, you know, the net result, I would say, is positive. Um, and that's a, a huge part of what allows me to do this sort of side hustle of attending protests because... I can just I can work on the fly wherever I need to be. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, that's it, been one of the great things. I want to get to some of those videos because you made some news this weekend, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Canada Proud lawsuit because uh, not many people know this, but you're also on my legal defense team. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so we'll address sort of where that's at because we've got some information that we want to give some people today just to keep everybody updated as everybody has a stake in this because of uh, the support that we've received, the financial support, the PR support, the moral support that we've received in the face of misinformation and disinformation in this country. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. Really happy to have you here. Like I said, comfort food. But uh, you were big news this weekend and uh, you spent a lot of time attending rallies with uh, rednecks and culture rallies you spent a lot of time do, doing the, the Chris Sky tours. You followed Christine Anderson around. I have no idea where Chris Sky is either. That's awesome. Um, but like really, really kettled that culture. And you're working on a special around it called Protest Mania, I believe. You can go to Karima's uh, Twitter feed and check it out, at Karima Rules, if you would like to support that. It's a tremendous initiative. But you're covering some real shit now, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you, some of your best work, some of the work that I've seen you do is with the Israel Hamas counter protest protest. We've seen so many different streets get shut down. You and I, and let's just preface it, have very different opinions on protests. I hate them all equally. Can't stand them. Um, and you and I, I think, have a different opinion on what a peaceful protest looks like. But some of the video that you put out this weekend was re it really bothered people. And it wasn't the fact that you put it out. You put out non narrative builders. You put out just what you see, just what people can consume, and they can draw their own conclusions. But the Toronto Sun ran with a story about police officers that were, I think it was Avenue 401, is that where this was at, the That's video? Right. Yep. Uh, and I want to get some backstory. Giving some, um, some protesters, some pro-Gaza protesters, uh, coffee, I think maybe some donuts, um, there's real heat. No donuts. There was no donuts. It was, it was creamer and like stirring sticks. There were no donuts. Okay, so no donuts. It was just creamer and stirring sticks and some coffee. Is that correct? Yes, one of those. You know, the take twelve. Yep. 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 yep absolutely. So, um, and that has raised the ire, the culture ire. It became a big story. It was in Fox News. Uh, it was all over the place. The Toronto Sun ran with it major major outlets that ran with the footage uh, like worldwide that you created this weekend because you've been legitimately embedding yourselves with these people and you've got some interesting backstory to it but uh take us through if you can um what we're about to watch and kind of and then we'll watch it together and then we'll kind of get into you know what has happened since this video has gone extremely viral okay so um for many weeks, um, there have been protests or demonstrations on overpasses, um, which is not something that's unique to, uh, in this case, Palestinian protesters um, or pro-Palestine protesters. Uh, we've seen this for the convoy. We've seen this um, for the Ukraine, for veterans. Um, so overpasses are used at times as this form of expression. Um, now, Avenue and 401 has been a particularly controversial overpass because uh, of the the proximity to various Jewish businesses, synagogues, etc. Well, um, can I just give some backstory? Avenue 401 area, um, that is a heavily Jewish populated area. There are, as you point out, a lot of synagogues, a lot of Hasidic Jews live in that area, Orthodox Jews. It is Toronto's filled with these enclaves and communities, and historically that area is known as a very Jewish neighborhood, correct? Yeah, I think yeah. that's a fair assessment. Um, now, there have been demonstrations 
on multiple overpasses simultaneously, uh, which includes Avenue and uh, 401. Um, but that's the one that has drawn the most attention because of where it's located. Um, and so I've, you know, for the past several weeks, um, witnessed a, a variety of things take place on this overpass. Um, there have been protests and counter protests in fairly equal size that kind of faced off. Um, there was a week that no one at all was allowed on the bridge and instead the demonstrations moved to the intersection of Avenue and Wilson, so more into the community as opposed to on the overpass. Um, and most recently, um, I, I was there and basically protesters showed up. Um, police blocked off the road when there were already 20 to 30 people on the bridge. Um, and then additional protesters were not allowed to join. Uh, and at some point, it seems that one of the protesters who had been there left to go to Tim Hortons, pick up some coffee. It was very windy and cold on the bridge. Um, so, you know, they, they went to go do that. Um, and by the time they came back, police had decided to block it off. And that's where this video comes in, because as kind of part of the negotiation, maybe a gesture of goodwill or de-escalating tension, um, rather than allow that person back onto the public thoroughfare, police just took the carton of coffee and moved it a few feet, carried it over to another protester. Um, and we captured that interaction, which I thought was, you know, kind of interesting, but not necessarily international news. Uh, <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, no shit, were you wrong? Here, let's watch the video. <laughs> By the way, you just gave me some context that hasn't appeared anywhere, just so you know, right? So this is why we do this, people, to get it right. Here's the video. Let's watch it together. I can come back, otherwise you would have said, okay, I understand. Okay, I'll, I'll just ask, just, I just, to, just so... There you go. Sorry, it's, uh, it's the person with the vest. Jihad? Yeah, I know the guy. No, I have the yellow vest on the bucket. How did... Uh, so these these guys were trying to get back on uh, into the protest and couldn't because they went to Tim Hortons. And so they had to or so this is the coffee that someone else got and they're giving the cops actually had to ferry it because they wouldn't allow the guy back into the protest. They took that coffee, gave it to the guys who were still protesting. Is that correct? Yes, it's the second one. Exactly right. Police okay. were ferrying it over. OK, perfect. So, so behind him is the overpass. Okay, yeah, I can see it right here. Let's listen to the rest of it. Your cameraman chimes in, always makes me laugh. Let's watch. How did, uh, how did you get coffee from the police? Uh, we're well, not the police. Someone, get, someone has brought it for us, but the police won't let them in. So the police is now becoming our little messengers between us. I don't know. I have no idea what's going on. We're, up, we're on the bridge. They're not letting anyone else come on, which makes no sense. Because if we're already on the bridge, how is there a public safety issue? All right, so there's some much-needed backstory. You in the background with that fur coat, by the way, look like a million bucks. Way to go. Um, <laughs> but so the story behind this, as it's out there, is real vague. It is TPS is gone woke. They're now giving coffee to Hamas supporters. That is one of the more dangerous narratives that's out there being curated by that video that you took and not played in its entirety and not given with any backstory. Am I wrong in assuming no, that? No, that's exactly it. Um, everyone from former public safety minister Marco Mendicino to like Infowars and Fox News um, have stripped this of context, taken just the part of the, the clip that doesn't include this little exchange between my videographer and the protester, um, where it's quite apparent that, you know, police weren't purchasing coffee and gifting it to them. It, it was shuttling it back and forth between the After two. After they put up a fucking, like a, a line in the sand saying to a protester, no, you can't go back there. And, and here's the real irony of things. That line in the sand um, was invisible. And protesters who were not allowed on um, at some point decided amongst themselves to just walk around the police 
uh, and that's what happened. And so it, it was all maybe within 15, 20 minutes of this interaction being filmed, it was a moot point because all of the protesters were back on the bridge. Um, so there's definitely something to be said about the police strategy here and the way that they are choosing to manage overpasses. Um, and I appreciate that on the one hand, they don't want to be heavy handed, but on the other hand, you know, the road needs to be accessible. So there are these competing interests at play, um, but the way it was dealt with uh, on, on Saturday, um, it, it was, you know, the, the protesters had their run of, of the area um, and ultimately they agreed to stay only on one side, exclusively on the sidewalk, not on the medians and not crossing back and forth. And then police reopened the bridge. Um, because from the protesters perspective, they, they don't necessarily want the overpass to be closed because partly they're, they're losing, you know, visibility of, of yeah. cars yeah. that are going back and forth. Um, and there's that public perception as well of shutting down critical infrastructure. Um, every time that I've seen it, um, you know, it's obviously police who make the decision uh, to, to block it. Um, it's not that people are holding hands and kind of themselves choosing to block it. Um, but in fairness to police, there have been genuine safety concerns um, that have led to that decision making. Uh, I'm, it wasn't clear to me on uh, Saturday why it was handled in that way. And, you know, the lesson or the takeaway, I guess, is the optics of that one moment of, of police carrying coffee. It, it was totally unnecessary because they just decided to take the overpass anyway. And, you know, it... it that's how it played yeah, out. There is they didn't follow through, right? The police didn't follow through. They didn't right. follow through with the threat of saying no more protesters on the bridge. And I want to get because there's a couple of competing stories here, right? I, I want to finish dealing with the narrative that's been curated through disinformation about that whole exchange, though. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to get to protest because, again, you and I have a very different opinion on people who should be allowed to protest. I hate them all equally. But to that point, you've got a narrative that is bolstered by the same bad actors and they've taken your video extremely out of context. You and I were talking about this last night in just a text exchange. Um, and you do work in good faith, right? Like you go out you cover these things, you cur you watch exchanges, you get the humanity of the moment. To me, that was a very human moment. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the police deciding that they were going to start feeding. And this is part of the narrative. Hamas sympathizers, terrorist sympathizers, right? That is all bullshit. That is a lie. That is not true. What had happened was, which we saw plainly play out in that video that you recorded in good faith, what happened was one of the pro-Gaza protesters, and we'll get to them and where they were protesting and why I disagree with it in a minute, but like, let's just deal with the, 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 the really untoward part here, is that once again... You know, the alt-right information machine takes something that is innocuous, what is a human moment, right, in this incredibly heated environment that we're in. They chop your video, take the entire context away from it, and they feed it to millions and millions of millions of people, and they say, look at these foreigners, look at these people, police are working with terrorists now, this is what Canada has become under Trudeau. Do you do you do you have anything to say about your good work being torqued like that? Yeah, it's very upsetting. Um, I I have kind of come to terms with the fact that I can control myself and what I put out there and not much else. Um, so where it's appropriate, you know, I will reach out and provide additional context, make clarifications, um, whether that's picked up or not, isn't really in my control. And I'm, I'm mindful that there are actors out there um, who have different objectives than me, right? Who aren't interested in showcasing the reality of what's happening on the ground, but are looking to serve particular agendas. Um, so that's something I, I grapple with, but 
you know, the alternative is to permanently self-censor because there was nothing about this video that at the time of posting, um, I, I would think that it, it kind of gets overblown in this way. Um, the other takeaway is it's, it, it's very revealing um, the way that even the police chief has responded to the video, issued an apology. Um, it, it is a response to, I would say, manufactured outrage, um, you know, a general frustration and exhaustion with protests um, and, and not exclusive to this issue. It's probably a cumulative effect over the past few years. Um, but this is a, especially touchy um, and people reacted in very strong ways, um, divorced from the reality of what was actually playing out. Um, and it kind of shows where um, even police interest and powers lie because uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I think it was, um, there was a, an incident where police were kneeling on a protester's neck. Um, and I don't recall there being any sort of apology or uh, anything of that nature. In fact, police denied that that incident happened, even though there's video of it. So on the one hand, you know, you have an actual egregious abuse of power and that gets swept under the rug. And then on the flip side, you have something that's fairly innocuous, but, you know, not great optics. And in the most dramatic of circumstances, maybe a police officer shouldn't have been transporting anything beyond their imaginary safety line, right? So there's, you know, you could maybe make some critiques, but overall, I think it was an attempt to just keep uh, everything calm and peaceful and you know, a minimized tension um, and the different reactions to that, um, it, it, it's very telling. Um, and and I, I find that fascinating, but also a bit disturbing. Oh, it, it's totally disturbing on a number of levels. First, you've got the first level is that um, the alt-right or the concert, call it what you want, uh, the the hard right media machine all ran the same narrative, all bastardized your work, all lied to people in bad faith about the point and what happened, what actually happened. Right. And we've just you've taken me through it. You were there. You're in the video. We could hear it. We watched it. You can believe what you saw. That's number one. Number two, you've got the police taking the perception of that, according to that narrative that's been written by those bad actors. You've got them doing damage control when legitimately all I saw, and keep in mind, again, I'll preface it with saying I don't like any of these protests. Um, what I saw was a cop trying to facilitate something to keep the peace, not even keep the peace, just doing something human. You can't come back here. I will take that coffee to them, but you have to stay here. That is a human thing to do. That is not a police. So the police, whether or not you believe in the police, you like the police, you wanted to fund the police. I happen to not want to fund the police. I think there are a lot of good cops out there. I think that very few uh, represent the majority, which is a shame. However, what we saw there was not bad policing. That was community policing. That was like, hey, we're trying to keep the peace. We're trying to do what's right. Uh, you can say that you have an issue with shutting the overpass or not. You can say the police are not doing their job. You can say all those things or they're, they're doing their job a la carte. But that, that to me is, that tells a story too, right? Where you hold that up against, you know, them not addressing kneeling on a protester's neck, but they will address hand delivering a thing of coffee to a group of people. Like as, hey, we're sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, we get it, blah, 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 blah. I haven't seen the chief's comments, so I can't speak to them. Maybe you can. But I mean, there are two escalating issues here that look terrible, right? Mm -hmm. First, you've got the narrative that drove that response. And then you've got the idea Right. The idea that that Canada and where this is happening is a shithole that's being over because this is the narrative they want to drive a shithole that's being overrun by immigrants. Right. That's mm -hmm. the narrative that those outlets are trying to drive to their base mm -hmm. because that's where that lands. That's the whole point of that. I, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, a, a couple of outlets to their credit. Um, in the article itself uh, included my comments or clarification or 
made reference to the situation, um, but in our sort of attention economy, uh, the number of people who make it to the substance of the article are few and far between. Um, so headlines have impact, screen grabs have impact, um, and that's something that we're going to have to contend with, plus the fact that a lot of, uh, at least on Twitter, the accounts driving it um, may not be operated by real people, right? Um, so there are these different layers of complexity to the situation, and it's all part and parcel of this information war, perception war. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I think we all get caught up in it. There's another visual that came from this weekend. I think you're at Nathan Phillips Square. There's a hockey rink in downtown Toronto. Uh, I took particular issue with this. I tweeted, ban this shit, because I believe we should ban it. Uh, you've got people that are pro-Palestine, or sorry, pro-Gaza, that showed up to a hockey rink where parents and kids are skating, enjoying an afternoon downtown Toronto uh, on this beautiful outdoor rink at City Hall. And uh, they are walking onto the ice with their flags um, where there is a foreign conflict and they are yelling at people that I believe they have blood on their hands uh, while you're skating. People are being murdered. Uh, I'll play a, a part of the video and then I want your opinion on it. I want to get into what is a peaceful protest or not. Here it is. Let's watch it. There you go. Uh, Olivia Chow, you can't hide. You support this genocide. I don't know how that long went on for, um, but I do want to point out that there are children there uh, skating with their parents and uh, enjoying a Sunday afternoon, and I don't find that peaceful. What are your thoughts? So, and this is, I, I think about this a lot as far as the effectiveness of protest, um, where the line between freedom of expression and civic engagement kind of butts with public order and people being safe, feeling safe. Um, and in this protest in particular, um, or rather the underlying cause, um, I'm mindful that there are within them certain, we'll call them perennial protesters, and these are folks who show up regardless of the cause because they just enjoy that mayhem or maybe have a wide variety of interests or like trouble, right? They so like there, wooden sticks and construction paper, big fans. So, so there are perennial protesters, but there are also a lot of people who are legitimately traumatized and are presently living through the experience of having their family members, their family homes, killed, destroyed. Um, and I, despite being um, part Palestinian, um, you know, my family isn't there anymore. So I, I, I can't understand the extent of that grief. Um, and knowing that protest in part is this expression um, where people feel powerless in other ways, they are not able to access the levers of power, this is the way that they can feel seen and heard, um, and, and as a result, will devise ways to get attention. Um, so knowing all of that, um, and knowing that people who are experiencing that kind of extreme shock may not be at their most polite or thoughtful or subdued. Um, even with that context, I think that sort of there's the bigger cause, the bigger issues, uh, the question of, you know, how are, are your are your actions helpful or harmful? And that's something that needs to be 
assessed on an individual basis. And there's this trend, um, again, which is much broader than just Israel-Palestine. There's this trend of forms of harassment being equated with activism. Um, and I think that's what we need to mm. reject wholly because mm. the, the lines have blurred a little bit. Um, and that there's been this progression from the anti-mandate to the convoy to the drag story time million person march. Um, there, there are just lines that are constantly being pushed and crossed and pushed and crossed. Um, and, you know, to, to what end and to what extent? Um, and that's the phenomenon that concerns me. Um, I, I think that... What, did the people get harassment mixed up with activism? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's online harassment <laughs> versus activism and in real life. Um, and that desire to want to be doing something because yeah. you feel like you can't do anything else. You're powerless otherwise. Um, you know, there's this, it, it's a very heavy sense, I think. Um, and that just, it is used to justify behavior that is objectively unacceptable, right? And- and That's objectively harassment, right? Like we just watched yes. that video of like, literally there's probably a hundred or maybe 150 people with children, some very young, two, three, four, five years old, skating around on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, Nathan Phillips Square. Maybe that was Sunday. I don't know. Was it Sunday? Was it Sunday or Saturday? That Which was on was Sunday. It? That was on Sunday, was on Sunday. the mayor's yes. annual skating party. Um, and there's actually another clip that we captured um, where uh, there was this elderly couple and um, they were skating and then they're face to face with these protesters on the ice. And, you know, it, it's. Isn't that harassment, though? Yeah, it, it, it objectively um, especially because th these are people who don't have sort of the power, right? Like these aren't politicians, even if it's at an event um, where the objective is to target a politician, you know, if I was consulting on uh, how do we best protest, you'd actually be a really good protest consultant. You've seen it all. I, I would be, yes, uh, actually people should hire me. Um, actually, but, you know, it, it wouldn't involve, megaphones and behavior that potentially not only puts people off the cause um and, and you can say as much as you want that well if you know your conscious can't lead you or you're not a real ally anyway but that's unproductive that's counterproductive um because the reality is we are coexisting have to coexist here right now and so what is the best way to achieve your objectives. And it depends on what the objectives are, um, because for some protesters, it's literally just to cause chaos. Um, but that, and that's what I'm saying. Doing well. like, but that's all we've seen over the past three years is just people that are trying to, in my opinion, that's just my opinion. I think that the ones who want to cause chaos are sort of the beating heart of this movement, right? And they're the ones who are calling shots, who are coming up with ideas, who are getting other people on board. And it has to do with this, you know, discourse or acceptance of harassment as activism. So, so that's the core issue because that's how you get well-meaning people who are, you know, you might run into at the grocery store or will save you a seat, like, you know, move their bag on the TTC so you can sit down like normal people. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly think it's acceptable to be screaming in a stranger about genocide kid. at a kid's skating party. Yeah. Right. But, but hold it. So in this, this is you, you've touched on my point and it's really nice that you've come around to my way of thinking. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking. I'm just, joking. <laughs> I know you haven't, um, but I know you're seeing things, right. And you have to ask those questions at what point, because of the charter of rights and freedoms, because of the way that we've lived, everything that you've seen, you're the most you, you schooled protest journalist in the country. You can identify the difference between a protest, a peaceful protest, which is allowed by our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and you can identify the difference between harassment. You can identify those two differences. I have not seen any difference, the impetus being completely different, right, from the convoy to this. I have seen no difference in the end result, which is the turning off of public sentiment based on the harassment of everyday Canadians trying to go about their 
day, mm -hmm. trying to go about their day, to get to work, trying to get home, trying to feed their families, trying to pay bills, trying to get to doctor's appointments, trying to cross a fucking overpass. Like that is the stuff. And I, I don't know about you, but I think by and large, we as Canadians with policy and law, need to decide and define what is a peaceful protest, not just in words in the charter. What is it? And what is harassment? That's what I think we have to do, because like I'm watching this happen on a on a on a weekly basis. And I'll be truthful. I get angry and not angry because I've, I'm entitled to not have my day disrupted. I know there are worthy causes. I know there are. And I support a peaceful rally where people want to be heard these aren't people that want to be heard in my opinion these are people that just want to harass us harass you harass other people so that we're uncomfortable so that you're not happy so that they are proving a point and i find it all unbelievably organized like too organized to be grassroots i don't know what you see but I look at it and I'm like, this has got to come from somewhere a lot like the convoy. And mm -hmm. I'm frustrated because I watch people take these narratives and they spin them into these things. And by and large, we're now mocking law enforcement for delivering cookies to, as some people would like you to think, terrorist sympathizers, right? Like that's kind of where we're at now because we refuse A, to deal with it. We allow not peaceful protests to happen and we say they're peaceful and they have a right to do it. I don't think people should have a right to disrupt traffic, to disrupt the way of life, to disrupt people getting to and from work. If you know where, where those people on that bridge get my support, if they're going to take that to Queens Park and walk right in the front door and they don't leave, that's who needs to hear those messages. Not some kids out skating and not an old couple that's out there for an afternoon trying to keep their limbs uh, limber. Right. Like that, that, that is harassment. What we have seen is harassment to the point where and, and dude, I was really uncomfortable because I was downtown. I'm on a streetcar and this is going to sound very elitist, even though, yes, I took a streetcar. I don't mind taking streetcars, subway streetcars. No problem. I'm pretty good at it. Uh, and I had to get off a streetcar because I ran into that protest. Like this is about four weeks ago. Walked right mm -hmm. into it. And then they're like, hey, you got to get off the streetcar. Everybody, there's a protest. I'm like, fuck. Walked right through it. Didn't care. Then I got to the next intersection. So it was Avenue. Uh, it was University. It's a university in King, I think, University in Queen, uh, and then walked to Young on Queen. And there's another protest, big old, beautiful protest of freedom fighters coming the other way, interrupting traffic. And I'm like, I get that we're in this time where people want to be heard and stuff like that. But at what point do we go? All right. This is in the Charter of Rights and Freedom. None of this is peaceful because you people are legitimately preventing people from actually doing business, getting to work and getting home to their families. That's my frustration. And am I wrong? Am I reading this wrong? Or uh, is this just my personal bugaboo about how much I hate protests? No, well, you're expressing an opinion, so you can't be wrong. But, you know, it, it's law is a contextual, like an exercise in contextual analysis. Right. So it's very fact dependent and changing a few facts here and there may result in a different outcome. Um, so that's why we have provisions or charter rights that kind of are not vague, but they, they don't account for every specific incident because that's what the case law does. Um, and the case law then assesses, well, you know, this is reasonable. That's not reasonable. Uh, police are justified here. This type of legislation is permissible because, you know, there are these compelling other reasons like the it's right there in the charter section one um, where it, none of the rights are absolute. Um, so you're correct on that, so that these are not absolute rights. Um, now, drilling down and how do we establish those parameters? That is a more challenging task. Um, and if we do that to the exclusion of addressing the real problem, which is social unrest, um, that's what all of these protests are. They are manifestations of social unrest, um, people who are unhappy or dissatisfied with aspects of their life, how the country is going, 
Uh, and, and that's broad and big and hard to tackle. But if we aren't looking at, at that, mm -hmm. then you're, we're going to end up with heavy handed enforcement and more money spent on policing. Um, and that's kind of an irony of, of these protests. Um, you know, it, it has ballooned the police budget um, because you have all of these public order units who are deployed. You have the horses sometimes. Um, you have... They had to buy new buses. Work. They had to buy new buses in the last, like, three years. They're like, yeah, we got to get buses to block, like, intersections. That's what you saw in that video they yeah. recorded, right? Yeah, those were shiny buses, so I bet that was a new bus. Brand new. Oh, yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> right, so, so that part is you know, that part's unfortunate because there's this short-sightedness and, you know, even though protests are collective, there's also this individualist kind of, well, our cause is worthy, this matters. Um, and, you know, how does it affect the bigger community? Mm, that's not always addressed. Um, I don't think that Queen's Park is the only legitimate site or venue for protest. Um, Doug but Ford's do, house, Doug Ford's house, then, right? You know, and and I remember having this debate um, or or discussion um, at the time uh, when anti lockdown, I think it was, um, protests were happening outside Ford's house, and mm -hmm. then some of the public servants' houses, right, like the chief medical officers and what have you, um, and and how do we draw that line? And part of it as well is the politicians don't make themselves very reachable. Right. And so as a result of that, people will find them where they're at, whether that's at home, whether that's at the skating rink for a public event. Um, and then it's, you know, people get mad at the protesters for doing that and understandably. But where are, are where's the access to these lever of power? Right. And, and it doesn't always exist. So that's kind of a. I, I, and I, I am saying this without any solution in mind. I don't know how, how to fix that, but that mm. seems to be the problem, that there is this division between the political and ruling class and, you know, people who are feeling disenfranchised. That, you know what, and I, I touched on that this weekend. <clears throat> it's one of the biggest issues that we face is that, you know, you, you don't have access to the people who have those levers of power for a reason. And the reason why you don't have access to it is because they don't want you to have access to them. They want to be able to kind of forge their agenda and they want you to fall in line with it. And I'm all about resistance in some circumstances when it comes to these institutions. I am. This kind of resistance only penalizes human beings who are not those people, though, right? This kind of resistance, whether and, and listen, I'm a fan of resistance. So when you say convoy, I'm not a fan of the convoy because I have full context of the convoy. I'm a fan of people pushing back against institutions. Right. That was not a protest. That was let's penalize people so that we are heard. Let's penalize human beings so that we can you know, be at the front of the, the, the conversation piece so that we can be at the top of the news cycle. Let's tell people what we want because we want to affect change. And I have yet to be involved and I've been through several protests. I've been to a QP protest. I've walked through dozens of them. I smashed my car into a cab protest once. <laughs> That's how much I hate protests. That is a true story. Back in 2003, there was a cab protest downtown Toronto. I'm like, they wouldn't let me out of the parking garage. I helped myself through the cars and hit a couple of them getting myself out because I didn't give a shit. I was like, that's how mad I was about the protest. And they were protesting over Uber being a thing. That was how long ago it was. Like, we don't like Uber. I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't care. I need to get home. That's what I have to do. So when we're penalized by that kind of stuff, I get frustrated. I get super angry. I get, I have an emotional response to it because I put myself in the position of the person who can't get across that uh, overpass or someone who has to get off a streetcar with a baby. Like I look at it from a very human perspective. So in the big scheme of things, I think you're right. And I think if we're able to kind of define or drill down into what a peaceful protest is, if it because like, you, you talk about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, like those freedoms to do that and where my freedoms begin. Right. That's mm -hmm. how we've all kind of understood the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Well, a lot of freedoms have been taken away by people deciding to penalize Torontonians or anybody around the world 
over a conflict that's happening 20,000 miles away. And I get it. I know what the conflict's about. I totally do. And I choose not to talk about certain aspects of it because I'm not schooled in certain aspects of it. But why, why do we have to pay the price consistently? Why does the Canadian public have to pay the price of angry people that don't like something that's happening to them or their families, whether it's here or somewhere else? And I don't understand that. I don't understand why they, they make us. That's why I said, hey, if you're angry, go to Queen's Park, invade the building, go and help yourself. Go and get some breath mints out of the bathroom if you want. Maybe steal some serviettes. I don't care. but what, Because they're the ones that are making us fight each other, right? That's what that is. When you see people, and you've seen it all, like what are the protests like where you've got um, is, these Israeli protesters and the Gaza protesters doing competing protests? What are those like? Um, so I've only witnessed that a few times. Um, and... The most memorable was Avenue and 401 on opposite sides of the overpass. Um, and it's it's talking at cross purposes. So everyone is there to be heard, but not to hear. Um, and, you know, it, it it's a lot of misdirected energy in my humble opinion. Um, and that's been my position consistently um, even with respect to the anti-mandate and convoy protests, that there are legitimate gripes and grievances, um, some more legitimate than others, but ultimately, you know, ultimately a lot of misguided energy. And that's not to say that protests are um, ineffective, because I think that they can and do prompt policy change, um, but are they the most effective tool and do the negatives outweigh the positives uh, at times i think the answer is yes but it's, it's always fact dependent i think we got some protest fatigue too i think that's factoring mm -hmm. into people's anger because i'm seeing yeah. a lot of people on certain sides of the equation that normally would never speak out against stuff like this go yeah that's enough right i think we're just tired of it there's got to be fatigue surprised you're not tired of it are you tired of being offered food by protesters because this picture of someone trying to give you a snack made me laugh look at your face that was before i knew that she was offering a snack um I, it was just a person approaching me from behind so i was just you know that that's i'm ready i'm just gearing up there um but no it was a gift it was friendly that's very nice yeah, yeah, um yeah. it's sealed so i only yeah. accept uh sealed packages sealed food yeah, sealed food, sealed cannabis, sealed beverages, we're good. Um, but nothing homemade, please. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, I, I like if someone brings you a zucchini loaf, you're not going, yeah, I'll, I'll have some of that. But not unless I know them. And even then, it depends on who, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to take safety precautions, I guess. Like if, Chris, um, if I brought you a zucchini loaf, you might eat it. But if Chris Sky brought you a zucchini loaf, you probably wouldn't eat it. That's my point. Right. I'm trying to picture Chris Sky baking a zucchini loaf. Um, <laughs> I would watch one two weeks. I would watch yeah, that. I would too. I would too. Sure. Probably turn it into like a Patreon thing where he did it. As <laughs> Probably. Um, so you're also part of this Canada Proud lawsuit. Um, and it kind of speaks to part of the conversation we we're having earlier about disinformation. So uh, for everybody that that is aware of this, Canada Proud sued me. What was this? Was it a month ago? Was it a month ago? About a month a month yeah yeah canada proud is a third party media organization uh owned by a company called mobilized media uh owned by a gentleman named jeff ballingall worked at navigator for a while torquing stories on behalf of navigator uh worked at sun news for a long period of time uh and then he started ontario proud uh unabashedly to help doug ford win the election and get the liberals out of power then he started a whole bunch of other proud networks bc proud canada proud massive following massive following um, and they sued us. <clears throat> now, you've been a part of my legal team. Not a lot of people know that. Uh, Karima likes to traverse the legal spectrum, by the way. Uh, and the reason why is because I trust you implicitly. And so you've been involved in every step of the way. Now, they sued me for defamation, correct? 
Um, the and this is the first time we're talking about it. our pleadings are coming out. We're going to post them uh, on our social medias everywhere, every account, uh, the Crier Media at its Dean Blundell. And uh, we haven't talked about it because we've been like I've been talking about it, obviously, because I, I know where things are at and things have been cleared through you and our legal team. Um, but these gentlemen accused me of defaming them by suggesting that Canada Proud helps organize anti-Trudeau events and that at these events, there are paid actors. There are people who are paid to be there. Correct? Isn't, is, is that not what they're, um, they're That's the saying? the crux of their complaint, yeah. The crux of their complaint is saying that they don't do that? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's, that's the whole point of, of the lawsuit, correct? It's the main point, yeah. The main point. And I think in there they took a couple shots at me, said I was a gadfly, said I was obnoxious, said I was homophobic. A lot of that stuff's been taken out, which whatever. I mean, roll over if you will. Um, but I, I, I want to point something out. And you as a lawyer, knowing all the details, right, knowing all the details because you've been involved from the ground floor of this lawsuit from Canada Proud and Jeff Ballingall, <laughs> exclusive agent of the Conservative Party of Canada and Pierre Polyev, when they sued me for $200,000 for suggesting that, and, and my immediate silence, wasn't there an injunction that they asked for saying you're not allowed to talk about us ever again? Mm -hmm. that? How's that yeah, going? Yeah, they're looking for an injunction. I mean, it'll all be decided on, but certain things might make that harder to achieve. Yeah, like this. Let me bring this up. So you and I talked about this last night. In 2019... Jeff Ballingall in Canada Proud admitted to, quote, paying people to wear banana costumes to push anti-Trudeau campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I do like a good costume. Yeah. I'll give him that. Keep in mind, I respect the legal profession, and I am really excited to go through the process of this very serious and i respect the courts i respect the ontario supreme court i respect our laws in this country it's you can tell that's all i've been talking about respect so they accuse me of suggesting that they help organize anti-trudeau events and said i defamed them and in their if i'm not mistaken their pleadings they flat out denied it right they said we don't do that is that correct like a couple of times in their pleadings? They said it was false, yeah. They said it was false? They said it was a lie? Mm -hmm. So can you read this headline for me one more time? Well, it says, Canada Proud paying people to wear banana costumes. Push anti-Trudeau campaign. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Okay, so that's going to be slightly problematic. Um, I'll just read you a little snippet from the story, if you can, Karima. Or would you like to read it? Uh, I love reading out loud, sure. Go ahead. Read out loud. According to an email obtained by CTV News sent by the experiential marketing firm Tigris Events that Canada Proud has hired to organize this event, the group will be paying a dozen brand ambassadors to distribute flyers and encourage people to engage with the ongoing social media campaign practically across the street from the Prime Minister's office. The people who sign up to take part and wear banana costumes will be paid $135 for the six hours they'll be out there, plus $20 for parking, or $120 for the half a dozen people dressed in branded yellow t-shirts and black shorts. Canada Proud is organizing a similar event at Young and Dundas in Toronto on Wednesday. <laughs> it's so nice seeing you happy. <laughs> oh, ho -ho. So what happens now? Well, we are going to file the defense and other pleadings and take it step by step. In your legal opinion, 
just a, just a strict legal opinion. Is that going to be problematic? It's fair to say problematic, yeah. What people can't see, if you're listening to this on Apple, Google, Spotify, etc., is Karima's face. <laughs> very hard not to be me right now. Just trying incredibly hard not to enjoy that. I, I was just asking. You're a lawyer. I just thought, yeah, I just wanted to kind of go through it's, that. It's fair to say problematic. Fair to say that's going to be problematic for them. the admission that the thing they're suing me for, the admission that they do that <laughs> in a news story. The trick is to keep track of your public statements. Um, and that can be hard to do in an age of social media when we're constantly you know, publishing stuff about ourselves. So, God, I love having you on the show. I really do. You're like a warm blanket. You're like a little warm legal blanket. That's what you are. <laughs> yeah. you're, like a, you're like a little warm protest blanket, too, where you, you come I've in. been using heated vests lately. Have you really? 10 out of 10, would recommend. Game changer? In the pro protest circuit? Heated vests? Mm -hmm. What about the, do you have heated gloves and heated boots? You can get those, too. Uh, I don't have either of those things, just the best, but it's a good best. Thank you for this. Mm -hmm. So good to see you. Likewise. Excellent work on the streets. Thank you for standing up for humanity. Thank you for admitting that some forms of protest are bordering harassment. No, I appreciate that, too. And thank you for wearing that blazer. Very professional look today. That's what I was going for. Really appreciate it. Don't get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. I'm not getting used to it. I expect full <laughs> Brett the Hitman heart gear tomorrow. So <laughs> Great to see you, buddy. Thanks, Dean. Take care. Kareem Assad, ladies and gentlemen, at Karima Rules is where you can find her on Twitter. Man, I love talking to her. So, yeah, that's going to be problematic. <laughs> I have been very silent, verbally silent about this whole Canada Proud lawsuit thing. Because when you get sued for $200,000 and they ask for an injunction for you to shut the F up and you know it's wrong, you know they lied, because that's a lie. When someone says you defame them by accusing them of organizing pro-Trudeau rallies and that people at some of those rallies are paid and they, they sue you and then they campaign off that lawsuit, they're lying. That's a lie. They lied in their lawsuit. They lied to you, which they do a lot. Canada Proud. It's why they have been widely outed as purveyors of some of the worst misinformation in this country. And they're going to lie all the way through this whole process. We're not. We're going to tell you the truth. We're going to tell you the truth every step of the way. We are going to post our pleadings after we file them, and we're going to post them right here. We're going to post them at crier.co. I'm going to post them across all of our socials, and it will contain the unabashed truth. And you will find some things out. And we will stand up and we will take this head on because like you, we know that we are lied to on a daily basis. And we know when a company that works exclusively for the Conservative Party of Canada, who we go after on a daily basis, for lying to you, the people that they pay to help curate all that, five years ago, five years ago admitted to paying people to wear banana costumes to push an anti-Trudeau campaign, $135 for six hours plus $20 for parking or $120 for the half dozen people dressed in yellow, branded yellow t-shirts and black shorts. Also organizing similar events at the Young Dundas Square in Toronto on Wednesday. And in their pleading, and I'll tell you this, in their pleading, they basically said I was a liar and I was delivering misinformation about them. Those are their own words. <laughs> That's Those are their own words. And so when you traverse the internet or you go through social media and you see all this stuff, 
I am never going to ask for your trust. I'm just going to continue to tell you the truth. And then you can build that foundation of trust in what we do here and people like Kareem and myself and everybody else at Cryer Media because we do not lie to you. We don't. They do. It appears they may have even lied in a legal document. According to that news story where they admitted to paying people through another agency to go and harass the prime minister of this country, in this environment, in this economy, what? That entire lawsuit hinges on that one thing. That one thing. That's why we've continued to talk about it. Because we're not lying. We do things in good faith. We entertain people with it. But more importantly, we have a sense of accountability and responsibility to you when we tell you things and we give you information. And I will say unreservedly, Canada Proud and the Proud Networks are an exclusive agent of the Conservative Party of Canada. Their only goal is to damage opponents of the Conservative Party of Canada and to damage the democratic fabric of this country by continually lying to you about issues, laws, cultural events, and the prime minister and the government of this country. Nonstop, day after day after day. And that's enough. And if we can stand here in front of it, for you, we will, and we do. There is nothing more important than that to me. Nothing. Nothing. I said it in a tweet thread this weekend is that I used to think that my whole goal in life was to get as much for me as I can and FT-dub, forget it, forget everybody. I don't feel that way anymore. And if it weren't for the good people that I have in my life, like Karima, our legal counsel, Fred Wu, don't know if I'm allowed to say his name, just did, don't care. <laughs> Karima's laughing in the green room. Um, and if it weren't for the almost 1,000 people in the past couple of weeks that have donated to our GoFundMe, we wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't. We might have just shut everything off out of fear. And that was the goal. That's their goal. Their goal is to threaten people, private citizens. Their goal is to threaten the truth with a lie. And then when you call it out, their goal is to threaten you to not talk about it. I have countless receipts, not only countless receipts. I just showed you a CTV news story from five years ago where they admitted to doing exactly that, and that is what they do. So when you think about who you can trust, you use your common sense, but at least dig into the information. We just had an entire conversation about reprogramming here. Reprogramming, you're thinking about the news story about the Toronto police officer just trying to do a good thing, taking, and say what you want about the protesters. I don't agree with any of it. Taking something to drink to somebody who couldn't go and get it. That's been turned into Toronto cops are emboldening terrorists, immigrant terrorists in this country, and they're destroying the fabric of Canada. That is a lie that was told to you by the Toronto Sun. Fox News, and several other right-leaning outlets. And probably was parroted by True North, Rebel News, and your friends at Canada Proud, whose expressed goal is to defeat Trudeau and destroy the enemies of the people who pay them, which is the Conservative Party of Canada. All right? We good? By the way, love the dildo ad at the bottom of the Toronto Sun article, Double Double Standard. Coffee cops. Absurd. Times are tough in print. I guess you'll take money from anybody. Anyway, I just want to thank you. The end of this podcast, I want to thank all the good people that want to stand up for democracy. And I'm, It's not just a word. It's not just like, oh, they stand up for democracy. You know how all those guys like Rebel, everybody says, stand up for this. No, oh, this isn't that. We're not going to game you. We're not going to use any of their talking points. We're not going to lie to you. We're not going to tell you, whoa, it's us. Never. We will never do that. We will just tell you the truth. And the truth is that we don't have Canada Proud money. We don't. 
They make hundreds of thousands of dollars from donations from conservative donors who want to give them money to do all the messaging on behalf of the conservative party because the conservative party has certain rules around election finance and marketing that they got to stick to. Well, having a, a third party agency is the answer to that very serious issue in this country that we need to deal with. And we are going to deal with it. Part of this exercise, because of your support, is we are now creating a tool for you to help identify misinformation, disinformation in any form in real time. And then gives you the source material for you to actually educate yourself or at least combat that. So any help you can be, any help you can give. If you go to my Twitter feed, at it's Dean Blundell, I'm sure you'll see the GoFundMe, Cryer Media GoFundMe. Not only does that help us in our legal defense against people who have clearly admitted to doing what they sued us for saying that they didn't do, which they do, which they admitted to. Their words, not mine. But we're going to build this tool. You have a stake in it. We would like to clean this mess up or at least have a role in cleaning this mess up. And listen, I, this isn't about me. I haven't talked about my needs. I haven't talked about the stress this has been on me, and I won't. We just look for the opportunity, and we just look for the solution, and the opportunity and the solution is, okay, everybody knows that there are bad faith actors out there who want to lie to you, and they want you to get angry, and they want you to fight me and me to fight you. Don't buy it. Don't buy it anymore. Just trust us. <laughs> and Karima. Those are the only two people you can trust. Me and Karima. That's pretty much it. At Kareem Rules, give her a follow. At it's Dean Blundell, you can give me a follow as well. And don't forget everything we do is at Cryer Media. Cryer Media is Cryer.co. Anywhere you can get our podcasts, including Google, Google, Apple, Spotify, etc. The video vo version of it, you can watch at YouTube. Cryer Media on YouTube or Dean Blundell Show on YouTube as well. And as if that weren't enough, we're on every social media app as well, Cryer Media, at its Dean Blundell. So please join us, uh, and we'll decipher how we get through all this bullshit together, and at least we'll have some fun doing it. Thanks to our friends and sponsors at Cantork. My God, I love Colin. He owns Cantork. They're in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, these guys are Canadian. So proud of uh, their Canadian manufacturing. They brought everything back from overseas several years ago, and they offer total solutions for bolting, loosening, fastening, tool rentals, calibration, repairs, custom fabrication, distribution opportunities. Cantorque offers a complete range of services, products, making your one-stop destination for all your bolting needs, saving you time and effort. Leading industrial tool experts, 20 years of experience and knowledge on the table, providing you with comprehensive solutions for any torque wrench that you need made, maintained, fabricated, or serviced. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Could be nuclear, railroad, could be metal, it could be forestry, it doesn't matter. Mining, you need to go and visit my friends at cantork.com. They will get you all the information you need and they will make you something that covers your bolting solution like that. Cantork, top of the line, torque tension tools, flange maintenance systems, and impact sockets. You can rely on the highest quality products that are designed to withstand even the most demanding conditions, ensuring optimal performance and peace of mind. Collins, my friend, he's got a podcast. You can also become a distributor. Go to cantork.com for more information as well. Also brought to you by our friends at Muse Massage Spa. Go to Muse Massage Spa today to get $20 off all 45 minute sessions, January 1st to 31st this month only. Uh, located at 1290 Finch Avenue West, it is a body rub parlor and it is Canada's final. Finest. Uh, they are sex works advocates as well. Their podcast is tremendous. Go to Muse on the Mic. Check out Muse on the Mic today with Emily and Riley. Great podcast. Great girls, too. Really funny. They talk about the foibles of the industry and they talk about taking you inside advocacy for men and women who appreciate workers in the sex work industry. So make sure you visit Muse Massage Spa today. And of course, uh, brought to you by Gitch, makers of Canada's best luxury underwear, boxer briefs with a pouch in the front. Buy three, get one free when you use promo code GITCH3 at checkout. Gitch is premium underwear, boxer brief designed with your movement in mind, made for all levels of performance so that you can walk, run, or sprint through your uh, your day. Barely there comfort, super soft, moisture wicking technology. You'll never take them off, and they're good for anything. You'll never want to take these off. Great waistband, too. It's a problem with some of these. Sometimes the waistband curls. No, 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 not these ones. Last forever, which is good because I keep underwear forever. Go to edsfineimports.com, the best underwear on the planet, boxer briefs, a uh, proprietary pouch in the front, big enough for Canadian men, but I'm sure you can fit into them in America as well. Go to Ed's Fine Imports. Gitch3 is your promo code. Gitch, engineered for any level of performance. Have a great day, everybody. Appreciate you being here.
Bop, ba, da, da, da. See you tomorrow. Be good to each other. Uh, and enough with the protests, right? Like, just uh, take a day. Take a knee. Take a knee. Stop, stop buzzing overpasses. Stop preventing people from getting to their lives. It's not peaceful. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.